In John chapter 3, Jesus Christ said, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He went on to clarify by saying, That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said, You must be born again. According to these words of Jesus, the moment you gave your life to Christ, he gave his spirit to you, and you were born into God's family. Here at Colonial, we are a family on a mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. That means that we're a spiritual family. And so our message to you today is this, welcome home. Since the dawn of time, God has placed people into families to grow them, to care for them, and to develop them. In fact, a child without a family is referred to as an orphan, and everybody knows that orphans face significant barriers to growing up into all that they were meant to become. Apart from the relationships and support and the challenge of family life, a person simply cannot become all that God intended. Same thing is true spiritually. From front to back, God's story in scriptures about how God the Father is calling men and women and children from every tongue, every tribe, every nation to come and participate in his forever family. Here at Colonial, we have a lot of fans of our message and fans of our music and fans of our weekend services. We recognize that God never called us to build a fan base, but a family. And so over the course of our time together today, we're gonna to celebrate life in God's family. And we're gonna provide you with opportunities to step out of the fan base and into the family. Why? Well, because spiritual family is what God is all about. Spiritual family is what you and I need the most. And spiritual family is the end game of everything we do here at Colonial. So let's begin our time today with two words. Welcome home. Think about home. Picture the word, like just picture it, home. Very different from the word house. Very different. House can be a cold word. You know, this house is cold, but home is a warm word. It makes you think of like family and, and food. House can be an empty word. You can have an empty house. But home is kind of a full word. It's, it's, it's full of life, full of energy. House is all about building. Home is all about belonging. There's an old poem, and it goes like this. A very interesting poem. It says this. It says, a house is, uh, a house is built of roof and beams. A home is built of love and dreams. Now, sadly, not everyone who lives in a house has a home. We all know the benefit of home. We all know the value of home. In fact, here's what we'll do. I'll begin a sentence out loud, and you can complete the sentence. We all know the value of home. We say things like, there's no place like, and we say, home is where the, where the heart is. At the end of a day, we come home like, ah, home, sweet. Right? We all understand. So let me ask you, where's your home? Not geographically, spiritually. Where's your home? According to scripture, when God invites people into a relationship with himself, he's inviting them into his spiritual family, which is your spiritual home. Newsflash, my friends, when you say yes to a relationship with God, according to scripture, you're also saying yes to relating with God's family. Scripture says it this way. I'll put this up on the screen. I want you to see this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Here's what it says. It says, for through him, this is Jesus, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now notice those terms right there. You see him, spirit, father. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Trinity. We're talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit working together. Well, working together doing what? Well, working together to build the household of God. God the Father sent Jesus Christ the Son into the world for our redemption. Jesus, the Son of God, did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He lived a perfect life of obedience to God that we could never live. And then he died and offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sin that we could never offer. So that all who come and trust in him would be reconciled to God in a relationship. And so God the Father and God the Son send God the Spirit into the world to draw 
people to Christ, to open our eyes to our need for Jesus, and to fill all who surrender their lives to him with new life, thus making us born again into the family of God. The question is why? Why would God bother with redemption? What's the end game? What's the goal? It's right here in our text. Notice in verse 19, the goal. So that we might become members of the household of God. Notice that phrase there, household of God. The work of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is to move people like you and me, to move people from stranger to member of the household of God. The question is, does that describe my experience with, with Christ? Because let's just be perfectly honest, man. There are a lot of people in our culture today who call themselves Christians but do not have any engagement at all in the family of God. In fact, a recent study revealed this. Recent study. The average Christian, not Christer, you know, Christmas, Easter, wedding, funeral, the average Christian, the one who calls themselves a follower of Christ, the average Christian gathers together on weekend worship two out of every nine weeks. The average Christian doesn't even show up hardly once a month to the get. God's taking a family photo every week, and half of us aren't even in the picture. God says, hey, I sent Jesus. We do the whole redemption thing so that you won't be, hey, don't be a stranger, but be a family member in the household of God. Listen, all we're doing here this weekend, listen, we're putting our cards on the table. This is God's will for you, and this is our heart here at Colonial, for you to find a spiritual family. And if it's not here, then somewhere else, but not nowhere. Find spiritual family. So what you're going to see today is you're going to see different opportunities and just hear different ways that you can step out of the fan club and into the family. Because spiritual family is what God is all about. Spiritual family is what, what the scriptures are all about. And spiritual family is what you and I need the most. And spiritual family is what we are dealing with and inviting you to this weekend. Watch this. Uh, my name is Mick Trumbo, and I'm the Connections Director here at Colonial Church. And uh, what I do is I help people get more involved and plugged in through serving, through small groups, uh, just any type of activity, any, anything that's going on here at church. You know, my ministry area has changed me this past summer really by being able to see the, the, the seemingly small things in life. It's awesome to be able to see somebody who is kind of a little in, intimidated. Maybe they don't, they don't know where they should start serving. They just they want to be plugged in somewhere, but they're just not quite sure. And taking that step of faith has been awesome because being able to see somebody take that step of faith, then see that continual growth um, is awesome. And that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to step out into faith and do life in community. And so that's a, a huge benefit that, that I get to be a part of, uh, to be able to help journey with the folks that are here each and every weekend. I see myself differently. I see myself as a, as a piece to the puzzle. And I think that the overall uh, experience that people have as they come in, it's very important from, 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 the, from the beginning, from the parking lot, uh, through the auditorium, the message, and, and back through the doors and out to the, the, the parking lot, that they have a great experience with us. And so, you know, it's, it's for me being able to see the puzzles and to see that everything comes together, that God's called all of us to do our part. And as we do that, uh, man, there's such an awesome synergy that God has uh, that takes place every weekend. And so it's, it's great to see from the from the outside in, to be a part of it, but to see from the outside in. Then also to see the team, as they start to recognize that God's using them in these ways, it encourages them. And it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's awesome to be able to see that in their faces, in their, in their attitudes, and to see that continual growth is, is, been, is awesome. Okay, some ways that people can get involved in, in uh, my ministry area is just taking that step. I mean, we, we, we have, uh, uh, if you have a smile and an attitude, of, great, of gratitude, then uh, serving would be awesome in a parking lot, greeting folks as they come in, or being an usher or a greeter at one of the doors. And uh, I, I want to I mention this too, is, is sometimes again, it is difficult to know, you know, where does God want me in church? And the most important thing is just take that first step. And that's, that's what God wants. He, he wants our heart. 
And so through that step, we're going to meet connect. We're going to meet folks. Connections are going to take place, and growth is going to take place. And uh, uh, I'll tell you, there may be somebody, somebody, somebody sitting here today that um, that may may be able to relate with this. I was one or two or three literally steps out of a church that I went to when I moved to Dallas because it was so large and um, I didn't know anybody. It was hard for me to get connected with anybody and uh, I'm not kidding you. I was like almost out the door and I had a nudge from God and said go find out about their serving options because they had a, a table for folks that could get plugged in serving and uh, I went over there and talked to them and they needed some help with a cafe and I didn't know anything about coffee but that I liked to drink it and so uh so I started serving, and that was the first time that God showed me that he uses my smile and my attitude in the life of other people. I mean, it was really, it was an aha moment for me because it would, whether it was five seconds handing somebody a cup of coffee and saying thank you or stepping off and having a two, three, four minute conversation with somebody, God used that in the life of other people. And that moment was a moment where I truly connected with God and I saw the big picture. And so if you're here today and again, if you're not sure how to get plugged in, what to, what, you know, what area, I encourage you just take a step. God, God will show you. He'll direct you. Let me ask you this question. How powerful are connections? A show of hands, how many have ever had your vehicle break down while you were in traffic? Can I see your hands? That's a great, uh, man, one time I was a Bible college student. I lived in Chicago. It was downtown Chicago. I was going to, to school one day, and I had this old gold wing. And I'm right downtown Chicago, 5 o'clock, rush hour, Ohio Street. Now, if you've ever been to Chicago, you know Ohio Street. That's, you don't get any more downtown than 5 o'clock, rush hour, Ohio Street. And my motorcycle died right in the middle of traffic. I was surrounded by all these people. You want to talk panic attack? I had a full head of hair before that moment. It was unbelievable. I pulled my bike off to the side, and then uh, the school that I went to was a couple blocks away, and a friend that drove in from the suburbs had a pickup. So I ran over them, like, dude, tell me you drove your pickup. Oh, yeah. So he and I ran back over. We got four dudes out of a saloon to come over and help us lift a 900, Gold Wings weigh 996 pounds, to lift that bike up, put in the back. When we got home, I was digging around, and I found out the problem. I located the issue. There was a loose connection in, the, in one of the cables. It's a loose connection. You think about all the power of that gold wing, all the capacity of that gold wing meant nothing because of a loose connection. It turns out, my friend, there is no power in a loose connection. Scripture says it this way. Romans chapter 12, verses 5 and 6 is this. It says, so we, we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us, what are the last two words? Let's say it. Use them. Let us use them. Notice it says we are one body here. In Christ, we're united by the Spirit into one body. And so what God did spiritually, unite us together in Christ, we have to choose to do practically which is to connect our gifts to the needs of other people. Now, here's some good news. For every spiritual gift that God places within his family, there's a corresponding need that another person has. So, or some of you here today, you go, I need some encouragement. There are others of you here today go, I can encourage. There's some of you here today going, I need a job. And there are others of you here go, I, I know how to help you find a job. There's some of you here today going, I need food or clothing and shelter. And there are many of you who are like, we've got some food and clothing and shelter that we would share. Listen, for every gift, there's a need. And there are many of us, our needs, like, our needs are being met. Listen, there's no power in a loose connection. How is your connection to the body of Christ? All the gifts here, all the things that God has placed, all the needs, they all fit together. But there's no power in a loose connection. And so often people come and go into church, go, oh, I didn't get my needs met. My, my response is, who knew you? Who knew anything? What kind of connection did you have? So everybody answer out loud, yes or no. These are yes or no questions. You can answer loud with me, okay? Yes or no. Can an unplugged toaster make toast? Yes or no? No. Will an unplugged refrigerator keep your food cold? Yes or no? And can a disconnected Christian access the gifts of other people? Yes or no? No. Why? 
because there's no power in a loose connection. Listen, what are we doing this weekend? We're putting our cards on the table. We're saying, listen, step out of the fan club and into the family. This place will feel like a family to you if you just take a simple step. So on the back of this little welcome home card is an area called Connections that we just talked about, that Mick just talked a little bit about. You notice on there, there's just a few opportunities and connections like usher, greeter, parking team, information team. This is not about tasks. This is about getting around some other people so you can get, it's just connections. So take a moment, even now. Look that over. And if one of those areas and connections, you go, hey, that, that might be something. I could do that, or I'm interested to know more. Just check that box and fill out the card. Because here's the reality. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, you're as connected as you choose to be. <laughs> My name is Clint Newton. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Colonial Church, and uh, we are a family on a mission, and our mission is to help people find and follow Jesus, and I'm all about that, the whole spectrum, but I get to come in as the discipleship pastor and really focus on the follow Jesus. So my job is to basically to train others, to train others and help others follow Jesus, and that's what we get to do all day long. Well, this summer was huge. I mean, every summer is big. This summer was big too. We had nearly 100 people step out of rows and into circles. They came from the service or whatever and decided to get into a small group. So that is huge, a lot of people. And we've had stories upon stories of life change, even during the summer. During the summer, the, there's a little bit of a lull, people go on vacation and that kind of thing, and it makes sense. But even during the summer, lots of life-changing stories. I've got a ton of them, but let me give you one. It impacts so many other lives, too. So we have one group of many, meets on Thursday nights. It's led by Dustin and Chelsea Campos. So we have Dustin. Dustin invites Sean, Sean Terry. Sean Terry goes and gets really active and really involved under Dustin's wing. And Sean is now off doing ministry in Oklahoma City. Dustin raised him up to do that. But before he left, Sean invited Dakota. And so it was Dustin, Sean, and Dakota. Dakota started coming to the group. He wasn't coming to church. He wasn't doing any of that. But now he's active. He's involved in the group. He's active at Colonial Church. And he wants to someday lead that group or his own group. And I'm sure he will. I have no doubt that he will. But so now we have Dustin, Sean, and Dakota. Dakota then invites his sister. And his sister starts coming to the group. So Dustin, Sean, Dakota, and his sister Mandy. And the beautiful part is Mandy starts coming and getting active in the group and all this stuff. And now Mandy is getting baptized here at Colonial Church. That's exciting. So there are many ways to get involved, but I would just, I just want people to, to know why they should get involved too. I mean, sure you can check a box and get into a group or whatever, it's what I'm supposed to do, but why do you want to do that? I mean, one, you, you want to know more about the Lord. You want to connect with Him further, and that's great. But two, look around you. I mean, look, look at the people beside you. Look at the guy's bald spot in front of you. Then look at Jim's when he comes back on the stage and you'll see, and then mine. Anyway, but, but look around you. And how many folks do you know? And then a better question is, how many know you? If you're not here next week, who's going to know? If you're sick, if you need help, who's going to know? Could be somebody, could be nobody. I don't know. But when we step out of rows and into circles, we get to know people and we get to be known. I sat in a church for four years one time. Years ago, when I was new in the faith, sat there for four years, just waiting for somebody to come and scoop me up. I was a spiritual orphan, you know, just begging for spiritual parents to adopt me, and nobody would. But the whole time, I knew where to go. I knew it was out there. I just didn't put myself into it. And so I sat there and got bitter and got mad. And then one day I decided to step into some of these opportunities. And who knew? There were people there that cared about me and loved me. And I just had to get into that. So that's what I'd invite you guys to do, is to just get into it. There are opportunities. Some of these opportunities that we have are Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and small groups. So Wednesday nights, we have Bible 101. We have Financial Peace University. 
On Sundays, we have re-engage. We have small groups that meet on Sundays also. And then also we have groups, small groups that meet throughout the whole week. Almost any night of the week you can pick and there's a small group that's meeting. If there's not and you need a different time, maybe consider leading a small group. We always have need for more small groups. Why? Because we want our groups to be small (laughs) and not large. There are small groups of six to 12 people They get together, they live life together, they know each other, they know what's going on because they love each other. They study the Bible together, they pray. That's what happens. So uh, hop in on a Saturday night class, hop in to re-engage on Sunday, get into a small group at some time, or lead a small group of your own. And there's plenty of training, and I can get you started from A to Z on how to do that, but those options are all out there for you. that out of rows and into circles out of the fan club and into the family I like that a lot here's the problem though just be completely honest there's a barrier and the big barrier is that in our culture today it's very very common for most people to think about a relationship with God as strictly between me and Jesus and we don't need anybody else and I'm just here to tell you that is not the story of Scripture that's a different one and that dog as they say in Texas don't hunt it just doesn't work in fact you can't get there from here that individualism approach gets you nowhere to the things of God all the things that God has for you in your life are on the other side of community and so I just want to do a quick rundown real quick just a, just a quick survey of things maybe maybe you've heard this before maybe not this word Savior in the Bible think about Savior Savior the word Savior is used 23 times in the New Testament 22 of the 23 times it's used in reference to Savior of a group of people not an individual 23 22 out of 23 times uh, the Apostle Paul used the word Lord 54 times in the New Testament 53 of the 54 times he said our Lord only one time did he say my Lord you know, most people, my Savior, my Lord. That's foreign to the Bible. In fact, the phrase children of God occurs nine different times in the New Testament. Nine. Children of God, children of God, children of God. The phrase child of God occurs no times in the New Testament. Zero. The story, of God's story in Scripture is not the story of isolated individuals with a private relationship with God. That's not the story. It's a story of God, a loving, wise, heavenly Father, inviting men, women, and children from every tribe, tongue, and nation to come and belong to his family, which is so much bigger than me and Jesus. We got our own thing going on. We don't need anybody else to tell us what to do. That's the American way. That's not the Bible. In reality, there are many of us who are trying to divorce God from his family to relate with us. And he won't do it. Trying to divorce God from his family is not only unwise, it's unbiblical. It's not only unbiblical, it's unwise. Many years ago, when I was a kid, I was 15 years old, and I was running down the street, and there was a giant mound of trash that was dumped. It was trash day, but it was over the sidewalk. It wasn't in front. It was covering the sidewalk, and I'm running down the street, and there's this big thing of trash. And I'm like, I'm going to jump that. So I'm running, I jump, and I was making six million dollar man sounds, right? So everybody knows the sound, right? I jump up in the air over, I'm halfway over this big mountain in here, and I look on the other side, and guess what I see? I see a pole sticking out, and I did what you just did. (gasps) And I tucked, and I rolled, and I hit this pole, and I landed on the other side, and I shook myself out, what's going on? I'm laying on my back, and this thing was laying on top of me. And I grabbed a hold of it, and it was actually going into my leg. I impaled my leg. The pole went into my knee here, and it came. I can show you if you want to see it. Yeah. It went in right there, and it came out right there. You can actually see how that, yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? So I'm laying on the ground. It's winter. I'm laying on the ground crying for help, and no one's around. No one hears me. No one sees me. You know what that feels like to lay on the cold ground with something sticking in your leg that you know is in your leg crying for help and knowing that no one can hear you or see you? And after a while, the nosy neighbor lady saw me. Thank God for the nosy neighbor lady. She called 911. They took me to the hospital. Right before surgery, the doctor looked at me, and I was all doped up. And he said, hey, um, just want you to know you're probably going to lose this leg. So I, you just need to know. And I woke up, and when I looked down, I didn't lose a leg. 
Why didn't I lose a leg? What happened? How come I didn't lose a leg? Here's how. It turns out my damaged leg was attached to a healthy body. And the health of my body became healing to my damaged leg. And I didn't lose the leg because the leg was attached to a healthy body. And listen, God has so much for you and for me in the family of God. In fact, I want to throw this scripture up on the screen. I want you to see this. Here's the scripture. 1 John 3, 1. It says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. Notice that word love right there. It's an expression of love from God to us, for us to be called children of God. Why? Because God knows every child needs a family to grow, to be cared for, and to develop. Listen, and your connection to that family isn't just growth and care and development. It's also your healing. There's some of you here that your marriage needs healing. And that healing will come in connection with the family. There are others who've been through what you're going through. And they can help you, but you're disconnected. They never know you're here. There are others of you that... The health of your fine, you like your finances are in disarray, and there are people here who are wise, and they can help you think it through and create a plan and live different. There's some of you here, your addictions, or maybe it's your family, or maybe it's whatever self-destructive cycle you've got going on. The answers are here within the family. Others who have walked and would love to share and walk with you through the same thing. So we're putting our card on the table. We are. We're saying, hey. We're a family. This place will feel like a family if you step out of circles and get into rows. So under the discipleship section on the back, you'll notice there are a few options. Take a moment right here now and you look at that and say, okay, there's like Wednesday classes and groups and Sunday groups and classes. I mean, it seems like classes and groups on Sundays and Wednesday, a lot of options. We don't do classes to do classes. We don't do classes for information. We do classes so you can get into a circle with other followers of Jesus and talk about how can we help each other become what God intended. That's why we're putting our cards on the table. And all we can do is invite you out of the fan club and into the family. Let me just say this. I can tell, you can tell, you can tell the size of a heart for God. Because in my opinion, according to Scripture, the size of a heart for God is directly proportional to the size of a heart for God's family. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Cummings. I'm the student director here at Colonial Church, and my responsibility is to create a fun, safe, and loving environment so students can own their faith in Christ. Man, student ministry was exciting this year. We had so many things happen during the summer months. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, summer camp. We went to summer camp this year. We go to Falls Creek in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And so many things happened at Falls Creek this year. For example, we had three students accept Christ. We had one student recommit his life to Christ. And we also had one student that actually wanted to start working in ministry and taking steps in that direction. So it was a great week. And there was one story that were, like sticks in my head that jumps out to me uh, when we talk about the summer uh, camp that we went to. Uh, there's one student that when we started uh, getting ready for summer camp, preparing to invite kids, whatever that, you know, get them ready to go to camp, he actually was uh, not wanting to go. He didn't want to be a part of it. He said, I've been to Falls Creek before. I don't really want to go. And I finally talked him into, between myself and Mark Davis, we talked him into going to camp with us. And then come Friday morning, which was exciting and, and you know, there was a turn. He started talking, having conversations. He was actually hanging out with the group, and he actually recommitted his life. And you got to imagine, we, we went from a kid that hated hated God altogether, felt like everybody was, like, against him, to at the end of the week, he was like, I've recommitted my life to Christ. I want to change my life. I want you to understand that 70 to 75% of high school students leave church completely upon graduation unless if there's some things that we change now here's the deal students have enough people walk in and out of their lives they need people to invest to lean in their lives so student ministry and being a small group leader calls for a, a level of, of expectation now i ask all my small group leaders right now for a one-year commitment to be able to lean in these students lives because the students won't open up and have conversations till they have somebody they trust somebody that cares about them so there's so many areas that are just, there's so many places that you can get involved in student ministry. It, you know, the first and the most important of that is our small group leaders. I, I've discussed it, and the importance of small group leaders is the person that's going to lean into these students' lives, that's going to be there to answer questions, to help them through 
struggles, somebody that they can trust that they can care for. But just like on a Sunday morning and a Saturday evening service, we need people to run CG booth, which is sound, tech equipment. Uh, and then we also need greeters, just like on a Sunday morning service. Uh, are on a weekend service and then we also need people to help with check-in different things that we have going on in the ministry now here's the cool thing is you have that card right now in your hand take time to fill that out and I will personally call you and ask you hey where can I get you involved what do you want to be a part of because man students are so important you know they're our future but we want them to own their own faith and through adults leaning into their lives that's where that's going to happen we're in church so you can't lie a show of hands, how many of you say junior high sucked? How many of you say high school sucked real bad? How many of you say I'm still working out issues from things that happened during those years? Let's be honest. I mean, let's be honest. Here's what scripture has to say. Psalm 78, verses 4 and 7 says this. It says that we will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Why would we do that? Verse 7. So that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Notice that phrase right there, not hide. Those who have seen and experienced the works of God in your life shouldn't hide those, but pass them on. To whom? To the next generation. Why would we do that? So that they don't forget who God is and not have hope. So let me ask you, if you've... If you've experienced the works of God in your life, here's a question, honest question. Are those things going to die with you when you die? Or are you going to pass those on to other people now? There's an old Yiddish proverb that says, you're one generation away from extinction. Whatever hope you have in Christ, will it die with you? Or will you invest it in the next generation? I believe that God has put dreams on your heart and my heart that we cannot fulfill ourselves because we must Equip the next generation to fulfill that part of the dream that we were never going to be able to fulfill. God is calling us out to be a part of the next generation, to tell of the great things that God has done in our lives into their lives, to invest. Let me ask you, uh, by show of hands, how many of your grandparents? Raise your hand. Uh, how many of you, if you're a grandparent here, you got to answer true or false, nice and loud. Grandparents, true or false, there's no greater joy than the joy of grandparenting. True or false? True. I'm a grandparent. I'm telling you, man, it's the greatest thing. There's some of you here today, you're ripping yourself off. You don't know the joy of spiritual parenting. You don't know this joy of spiritual grandparenting, of taking the good things God has done in your life, how he has shown you hope and, and developed hope in your life and passed it on to the next generation. You're just not doing it. And you're ripping yourself off. We're putting our cards on the table. We're inviting you. You have seen the works of God. Are they going to die with you? Or are you going to plant them in the next generation? Because that's the only soil you get. We're putting our cards on the table. On the back of this card, you saw some areas in student. And again, they're just areas like, like you know, small group leader, get in a circle with students, or, or check in and greet, or just, just simply learning to befriend and hang around students, technical stuff. Maybe you just want to be behind the scenes, want to be around. You can be involved. Figure out what might be some way that you could plant in the next generation. Listen, you should not hide the great things that God has done in your life. You should not hoard the great things that God has done in your life. Rather, you should plant them into the hearts of the next generation. Listen, we're not talking about volunteer involvement. We're talking about you passing on what others have passed on to you. Don't break the chain. My name is Ashley Marks, and I am the elementary coordinator here at Colonial. Um, pretty much anything that your kid is going to do here at church, first through fifth grade, that's going to be me, any activities or Bible lessons or anything, so that's just what I do. When Colonial kids, I mean, we, I mean, just down to our core, we believe that every child is created in the image of God, and He has a divine purpose for for your journey, to, you know, to glorify Him and for His kingdom. And so in everything that we do and we say and we speak, we just want to, uh, we want to just reiterate that to the parents and to the kids. I mean, because we really do, we really believe that, you know, we tell the kids all the time, God created you down to the hair on your head for Him, for a reason. And even if you can't see it now or it doesn't seem like it now, He does have a plan 
for what's going on. It's just we have to we have to have enough faith, you know, to believe that uh, even if we can't see it, it's going that way. When I think about a story, one little girl comes to mind, and um, she had the same small group leader for a year, and the whole year, it was just, it was a really tough year for this little girl. Um, there was never any specifics talked about, or she was just always the kid who was, you know, either not talking, or she was making sure she was doing something to get attention onto her away from the group, or um, just crying, and we just, me and her small group leader just knew that something there wasn't right. Um, we talked to her a couple of times, but we really didn't get a whole lot back from her. Kids, they don't always want to open up. Um, so over the year, me and her small group leader, we just prayed, and we just prayed for this little girl and for the situation to work itself out um, and just tried to make ourselves more available to her, you know, calling her, asking her how her week went. Um, just what we think is little things uh, in their eyes sometimes means the most. Um, and then I don't even know what happened, but one weekend, I just, I glanced over and all of a sudden her and her small group leader were just off to the side and they were just bawling and, and I heard her praying and so I just walked over there. Um, and right there, this little girl had just, were, she was just telling us things that no little kid should ever have to go through or, or still is going through and be around. And so it just broke our hearts in a million little pieces. And so, I mean, and it was awesome to hear the small group leader take over that conversation and just tell her how much we love her, God loves her that much more. Oh, there are so many ways in Colonial Kids Ministry to get involved. I mean, we would love to just have smiling faces, you know, just checking new family members in and saying, hi, welcome home, we're happy to have you, and showing them to their classroom. Uh, we also have, you know, great opportunities for if you want to be in a room teaching curriculum, if you want to be a small group leader, you know, for elementary kids. We have so many different areas that you can come be a part of our family and get to meet some pretty awesome kids and uh, help, them, help them on their journey. Probably the only thing that I would like to add was just that I didn't come here to be part of the Colonial staff. This is where my family found God. This is where our church home is. So this, just, this isn't just my job. This is, this is my family. So come join us. catch that? This is where my family found God. Our whole family. I don't know if you realize this, but faith is a perishable reality. Faith must be renewed. Faith can get old. Faith can get stale. Faith can shrivel. I want you to see these words of Jesus Christ. Here's the question I want to burn into your mind. How do you renew a dying faith, a shriveling faith? How do you renew a faith that's going cold? Here it is. The words of Jesus. Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn, everyone say turn. It's not the way you're going. It's the, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom heaven. Notice this phrase, become like children. According to Jesus, unless your faith matches the faith of a child, we're doing something wrong. The question is, what's childlike faith? Well, here's the answer. It ain't childish faith. Think about how a little dinky child trusts their parent. They trust their parent humbly. They're not sophisticated enough to, to maneuver and manipulate. They just humbly trust their parent. They trust their parent wholeheartedly. They're just all in. They just believe what they're told. They're just all in. They trust their parent obediently when they're real little. When they get bigger, they change a little bit. Listen, I've, man, I grew up in an unchurched home. At the age of 22, as a drug dealer, death metal drummer, I had an experience with Christ, and for the first time in my life, I opened my life to Christ, and he transformed me. And right away, I was given a Bible, began to read the Bible. It was incredible. I was learning a lot of stuff. But we got whisked up into a local church. And it was in that local church that I developed a solid, grounded faith. Guess how it happened? It wasn't reading the Bible at home. I was doing that. It was by telling Bible stories to kids on the weekend and, and to kids on a Wednesday night. They asked me, Sunday mornings and Wednesdays, to come and tell Bible stories. So I hung out with these little kids, and I was telling them stories. And we were in this Jesus journey together, and it just gave me a grounded 
faith. Some of you, your faith is shriveling and is dying. And you need desperately more than anything to get around some kids and get your faith back. And we're, we're putting our cards on the table. Come and serve in Colonial Kids. Not because we need volunteers, because do it for your faith. Get around some kids. Tell the Jesus story and let their faith transform yours. We're putting our cards on the table. Here it is on the back. Just a few options. Just like the other ones. Like you can be small group leader or room leader, maybe check in or greeter. Just look it over and say, I could do that. Do it for your faith. Because those kids, man, they're not old enough to manipulate. They're not old enough to play the religious games yet. You need them. You need them. Alexander was, by all accounts, one of the greatest commanders in all of history. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, he never lost a war, ever. And one time, a soldier, young boy, was caught, ran from the battle, was hiding. So they brought him to Alexander and threw him down at the ground at the feet of Alexander the Great. And so he comes to this boy and he leans over and he says, what's your name, boy? Tell me your name, son. And the boy looking at the ground mumbled some stuff and Alexander was getting a little fired up. He's like, son, I asked you, what is your name? Tell me your name. And the boy looked up and said, sir, my, my name is Alexander name is yours. And in one moment, Alexander the Great just swept his child up off the ground, pulled him eye to eye. And he said, my name is Alexander. You change your life or you change your name. Let me ask you, what do you call yourself? If your answer is, Christian, you've just seen from Scripture. Christians are part of a body to which they share. Christians are part of family to which they participate. Christians are part of the household of God to which they belong. If you call yourself a Christian, but don't do what Christians do, hey, listen, you either change your life, you change your name. 75% of students are going to finish school, finish high school, walk away and go, Pfft. and guess why? Right here. It's not some college professor. It's not God is dead. It's right here. It's the BS that we did in our little church game that they're walking away from. The last words of Jesus Christ were words of spiritual family. These are the words of Jesus. We'll put them up on the screen. This is commonly known as the Great Commission. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he said, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. What is the command? The only imperative grammatically in this command is make disciples. The command is to take non-disciples of all nations and make them into disciples, followers of Jesus. And those who respond by surrendering their lives to Christ are to be baptized. And notice the text says baptized in the name, singular, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Listen, baptism is not for isolated individuals who have a private relationship with God. That's not what it is. Baptism is an announcement that says, welcome home to the family of God. And in just a moment, we're going to celebrate some baptisms together. But before we do, let's take a moment and let's bow and let's pray. God, we recognize this again, it was always, every time we open the scriptures, we see you so clear that you are a loving, wise, heavenly father. And that it's an expression of your love that we might be called sons and daughters of God. And so you put us into your spiritual family where we can grow, where we can be cared for and help care for others and where we can develop into all that you have intended. But God, there are many of us. We've been infected by a different story. It's a story of trying to pull you away from your family as though we could have you to ourselves. 
and we just realize today that's, that's not your story. There's no healing there. There's no life there. There's no reality there. God, in this moment, in this time, in these baptisms, may we see a full display of what Jesus did, not to bring us as individuals to heaven, but as orphans into a family to become sons and daughters of the living God.